gentlemen, let's welcome yes. Jake Steffen. Yes, thank you <laughs> for joining us. Well, absolutely. Thanks for having me. You know, we just play hard to get really well. You know, and it's, you know, all good things come to those who wait. Let's throw whatever cliche we want to throw at. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, we're, we're excited to be here. It's always, it's always cool to sit on chat about things that are fun and interesting. And yeah. So this will be good. Yeah, it, it will be. So, Jake, what is it that people think you do for a living? Mm-hmm. That's a good question for people in our field. Absolutely. Mom would, would tell you that she doesn't understand how anybody wouldn't know who I am and who exactly. couldn't love me sort of thing. <laughs> but I'm not sure that that really works. So shout out to mom. Uh, shout out to all the moms. Out all there. the moms out there. All the moms. Yeah, absolutely. All the moms. No, so uh, Jake Steffen, you know, I'm, I've been in Atlanta now for 24 years. And so I think a lot of people associate me to Atlanta yeah. at this point. But in reality, I grew up in Chicago, so I'm a, I'm a Midwesterner. Yes. and. Yeah, and uh, went to school at Marquette up in Milwaukee. Dude, Marquette, that's where you went. Yes, it is. We have that in common. Yes. Jenna went to Marquette. Mm -hmm. And I forgot because we, we were talking, Jake, about that at one conference in Colorado. I think we were talking about, you might have brought that up, and it was a coincidence that my wife went to Marquette, and you guys probably didn't go at the same time. Uh, we did not. You guys are a little off there? That's no that's big deal. <laughs> Your wife looks a lot better than I do. She did not graduate when I graduated. I swear I put enough makeup on you and the lighting I thought was right, but okay. So, Jake, tell me why you chose Marquette. What what drew you there? What what was the choice that you were like, this is where I can see myself? Growing up in Chicago, Milwaukee is just like a suburb, right? Like yeah. Chicagoans, like we, we are the king of everything in the Midwest. We have that belief. That's what we say. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to Milwaukee thinking, well, it's far enough away from, from Chicago that, yeah. you know, my parents aren't, not, they're not going to be around everywhere, but yeah. I can still get back whenever I need to. So there's a little bit of that feeling of a lifeline. And, mm -hmm. and so I just kind of went, you know, I, I like, I fell in love with Marquette, which was funny. I had no real intention of going to Marquette. I didn't know anything about Marquette mm -hmm. until really late into my college kind of pursuit, so to speak, trying sure. to figure out where I was going to go. And I'd been to a bunch of different places and Northwestern and Illinois and all the typical Midwestern engineering school sort of things. And uh, thought I was going to be a chemical engineer. That's like what I was interested in. Wow. And but ended up at Marquette on a, on a thing because they threw me a bunch of money and scholarships. Right. And I was like, well, I'm, I got to check this out, right? Because yeah. I had to pay for a vast majority of my, my college education. Sure. And so I was like, well, I'll pay attention to the numbers. <laughs> sure, yeah, why not? Totally. Show me the, show me the yeah, money. Yeah, absolutely. So I went up there on a, like a really awful, rainy, February, cold, gray <laughs> day in downtown Milwaukee. And regardless of the really awful gray day and weather, there was just something about walking around and doing the tour and, and all that stuff where I was like, man, I could, I could be here. This is, this is pretty cool. So ultimately just, you know, with a lot of big decisions in my life, just went with my gut of saying, this is where I'm going to go. Yeah. And they had no chemical engineering. Uh, so I was like, all right, well, that's out the window. Yeah. <laughs> uh, don't really know what I was getting into anyway. And so I was like, all right, well, the civil engineering thing is, it's got environmental in it and environmental's got to be like chemical, right? Like yeah, sure. it's got to be. Totally. <laughs> and uh, so, so I jumped into that and then, you know, halfway through, I guess they have a great co-op program up at Marquette where you get to go and get in industry. And I just knew I wanted to do that. And so I ended up with a construction firm in Opus who's still around today, but nowhere near as big as they were sure. back then. And, by the time I left college after doing that, I was like, man, I hate environmental engineering. I don't want anything to do with it. Let me build and, and construct, and this, build. Is, this yeah. is where I want to be. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I did, and I randomly just ended up in Atlanta because Opus, Opus was booming. You know, the late 90s yeah. were really good for construction, yeah. and so there were a lot of jobs, and I had a bunch of different offers, and... Uh, and Opus had a bunch of work, and they hired like six, I think it was five or six young PMs yeah. at the end of 98. Okay. And I graduated in 99. And so I got the old, well, we really like you, but we need the help now. And by the summer, we're going to have all these young folks. So we don't really have a job for you here, but how about Minneapolis? Or how about Orange County? Or how about D.C.? And I was like, well, I don't want to go any further north. And California is just way too goofy for me, so I'm not going out there. I'll go to D.C. and I'll look at D.C. Sure. and kick that around. But it was just like, man, I mean, 
DC is just, it's politics all the time. I figured if I was going to look at all those other opportunities for Opus and other places, then I had to look at other opportunities just scattered around the country and find the best one that fit me the most. And randomly ended up with this small little itty bitty upstart contracting company in Atlanta that, you know, had great aspirations to do wonderful things. But I mean, I started in 99, I think design build was $40 million worth of construction a year, something along those lines. That's it? Yeah. (laughs) They'd found it in 95 in Atlanta. And so, you know, it was barely four years old. Uh, Arco, the enterprise at that time, had only started in 92. So I think Arco, the enterprise was doing somewhere around a couple, uh, we hadn't even hit a couple hundred million, I think, at that point. We're just close to it. Most of that was actually down in Tampa, out of that office at the time. And but so I design build was was ninety nine. Ninety five is when it started. I got there in ninety nine, so I don't really think it started until ninety nine. Of right, course, of course. I, Jake, there's like nine hundred million Arcos out there. <laughs> there's you got Arco Design Build and Arco National and Arco Murray and Arco Gas Stations and <laughs> a lot of Arcos out there. Jake, can you help us kind of figure understand out? it yeah, all? Yeah, let's understand it all. There are five Arcos as it exists today. Okay. okay. Now, those are five independent ESOPs that all They're work. all separate. They're all separate ESOPs. All of us have converted over to ESOP in the, the, yeah. the true spirit of what ARCO was founded on, which was the idea of you know, creating... There's a lot of we, the four core values in reality, but the last core value after treating people fairly, doing the right thing, having fun, and understanding your client's business. After those three, there's you know, create opportunity for individuals financial success based on merit. Yeah. And so the I idea the idea yeah, being Jeff and Dick wanted, they, they had come from Jeff Cook, Dick Arnold, the founders of ARCA, the AR and the CO. Yeah. And the name, uh, they came from a company called R.W. Murray back in, well, in 92. And Murray is still around and still a very good design build company in, in some circles are considered to be the pioneers of, of design build construction and, and really one of the first ones to do it kind of on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. And it was very successful for them. But Jeff and Dick's biggest knock was that Bob Murray was the sole owner of R.W. Murray. And so they got, you know, like a lot of things, they were like, look, we're all contributing. And, and Bob treated them very well. But at the same point in time, they wanted a little bit more than that. Yeah. And their relationship with Bob was very good, but unfortunately it was one of those things where it was like, look, you know, we kind of want to do more than just what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Bob understood that. Uh, yeah. Bob was actually yeah. thinking of retiring and was going to okay. sell the company to a handful of them. But then kind of last minute, had a little bit of uh, literally like damn near 11th hour, kind of had some cold feet on that idea of, of what was he going to do post mm-hmm. afterwards and decided you know what, I don't want to do that, but I'm going to sell a portion of it to, to Jeff and Dick because I told you that we were going to do that. So yeah. they basically took the industrial business and, and started that. And so started in St. Louis and started with the Tampa office as well, which was doing some industrial work. So very young in 92, but as part of that, Jeff and Dick, because of their experiences, knew that they wanted to create this opportunity to, to create. You know, When I first met Jeff, it was, I want to create 10 millionaires in my lifetime. And he's far, far surpassed that at this point in time. That's freaking cool. That's awesome to have that as like be your goal. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing these core values and, and I'm like, man, these are different than just about everybody else's that I've been to. And, and I'm, I'm listening to Jeff talk about things like that. I'm listening to Rick Schultz, who's my mentor, the guy that started Atlanta, mm-hmm. talk about these things. And you just, there's an energy you feel with companies, right? And that's, you know, it's part of what you've tried to create here and are creating here with Freeze is something different, right? And, mm-hmm. And so I think that's that's a very it's just it, it people with the right sort of I don't know personality or type will gravitate to that sort of thing. Attitude, baby. Yeah, yeah that's another cliche, man. Attitude determines your altitude, baby. <laughs> it does, it does, and it impacts your culture. So it sounds like Argo's got a pretty solid culture. Oh, absolutely. Are you a Bears fan? Though? Of course I'm a Bears fan. I grew up in Chicago. Like that's just in your blood. It's like part of your DNA. Of course. And then you You're a Bay Packer fan. And then you go across the border into Wisconsin and you go to school at Marquette. And for the five years that I was at Marquette, the stupid Bears didn't beat the Packers a single damn time. 
And that was yeah, peak that was, Brett Favre years. Brett Favre years. So yeah. I have a strong <laughs> hatred for Favre. I have a strong hatred for Rogers. Yeah. It's just kind of like what it is. I married across the Cheddar Curtain. My wife is from Milwaukee. We have the Cheddar very, Curtain. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have very difficult two weeks a year, except for that random weird time that you get a third playoff game, which is even worse. Yeah. But we've survived that. I'm raising one agnostic uh, NFL fan that just likes football, and then I've got another one that is a diehard Packers fan. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely oh love it. Oh, my god! I love it. <laughs> diehard Packers fan. That's got to be so tough. That makes for an odd Thanksgiving. <laughs> or Christmas. I suppose. Or Sundays. It's fantastic. Peter Bartel, never heard of him. Yeah, right. <laughs> never heard of him. Who's that? Uh, Peter Bartel. What is that minute... Uh, so we do tequila shots. There you go. Is that, is that the deal? No, Bartel no, no. tequila shots? No, no. We have another we have another name that we do tequila shots when his name is mentioned. But Bartel is great. He he's a big supporter of our podcast, yes, uh, yes. Versaphone. So we yeah. had a shout out to my boy Peter yes. Versaphone. Good people. Peter. Great kudos. People. Yes. Throws a hell of a tailgate up there. Throws a hell of it every day. Well, that's very <laughs> true. Oh, he was recently in the newspaper. Actually, my grandfather not knowing this cut out a picture of opening day for the Milwaukee Brewers and mailed it to my father just to let him know down in Texas probably what he's missing <laughs> and my grandfather didn't know and I don't even think my dad saw it right away but it is literally a picture of Peter Bartel decked out head to toe mm -hmm. in Milwaukee Brewers, logo blazer, logo <laughs> pants, yes. just out there doing his tailgating thing that mm -hmm. he does. And so I thought that was hilarious. Peter does everything big. <gasps> he sure does. Bartel is a, he is a character for me, all sorts. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to miss him on the SEBA board because he threw the best little he mini SEBA board parties. Yeah, he served all his, uh, his time is done. His, his clock is up. I didn't know. I, yeah. Yeah, I've i lost the term, touch limit, the term limit is all up. Yeah, so a lot of things have changed on that board. And, you know, we're, there's a lot of people that want to get on the board and, mm -hmm. and be involved. And we're trying to create term limits and, you know, take a one-year cool-off period before you can get back yeah. on. Just to let some new blood come yeah, in think, there. I think it all makes sense. Get yeah. new ideas going. I hear the Rick Schultz name uh, yep. get thrown out all the time. And, you know, I've never had a chance to meet. Yeah, I've always wanted to. Is he like retired, retired now, or is he kind of? So he up? is. He is. Uh, he's active on the board of directors for Arco, but okay. that's that's it at this point in time. Okay. So he he uh, he started in '95 in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. he, he was one of the original ones that came over from from Murray Company with Jeff and Dick in '92. So yeah, he's been a lifer for Arco for you know since its existence and 30 years of blood, sweat, and tears. And like I say, we were maybe 40 million when I started and you know last year we did 2.25 billion so it's been a heck of a little bit of ride yeah. for him and he, he's built something pretty amazing and he's uh getting to enjoy that now so yeah, kudos to him for that congrats on that I know you and your team a big part of that yeah so you had said that he was your mentor I guess is there a specific lesson or something that stands out from the time that you were learning yeah. from him that is something that you'd want to share with our listeners. There's a lot of, like, you look back in your career, and sometimes you learn stuff and you just don't even know it. Yes. Right? Like, you know, sometimes you learn something, like, out of a book, and you're like, oh, okay, I remember that. But sometimes you just look back on things and you go, okay, now I understand, like, differently than, than what I did before. And, and so, you know, part of what Schultz taught me early on, I think, was he taught me how important it is to provide people the opportunity to, to spread their wings, not hold them back, let them do whatever they think they can do, mm -hmm. but also have the understanding that by doing that, they're going to make mistakes, yes. right? And so, like, the mistake isn't the problem. Mm -hmm. It's it's not, if you're not making mistakes, you're not doing anything, exactly. right? So you, you have to be sure. out there trying. Yeah. And so it's not the mistake, it's how you react to what happened with the mistake that defines you as a person or as a company or whatever, however you want to look at. And that's what really, Schultz taught me that early, like, and how important that is from a cultural standpoint with your team to be able to do that. And, you know, I, I got asked a little while ago, somebody just randomly in a conversation said, hey, when did you know you really, you made it, you were good? Like, because you're young, right? And you're kind of, you, you don't really know if you're good or not good at stuff. You have a belief in yourself, but at the same point in time, 
you're new into a business. I had never, I'd been sort of in construction, but I hadn't been at all in cold storage. And a lot of what I was doing out of the gates had to do with cold storage. And to me, it's just like, oh, it's just a bunch of new stuff that you're learning. Yeah. But you don't really know if you're good at it until like you've been in it for a little while and you look back and you go, well, I guess I made it this long, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and for me, it didn't really hit me until the third time I thought I was going to get fired and then <laughs> didn't get fired. Okay. Right? <laughs> it was, well, it's like. <laughs> totally. You do something and you're like, man, I, I really effed that up. <laughs> I think I've made a couple of those mistakes in my career. Just that's for sure. Just a few, babe. Just I've a few. Had a, I've had a couple, three uh, F-ups in my career. I'm like, man, I'm getting fired for this one. <laughs> that sort of stuff goes through your head. But then when you realize that, okay, not only do you know that you screwed it up and you're kind of beating yourself up for it, but the reaction from your leadership team, in this instance, Rick, is, hey, don't worry about it. I got it. I put you in this spot. It's not your fault. You shouldn't have been here. I should have done more. I'll take care of this, right? Mm -hmm. And by taking care of it, what he really means is he's he's taken the, the shouldering of the, of the, the pain, so to speak, mm -hmm. From, from the upper management, from the Jeffs and the Dicks and, and the other people that, that don't know what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And they don't see everything, right? So mm -hmm. it's at that point in time you learn that, well, I must be doing something okay. Because this guy over here who knows his shit and knows everything and has found it, and his ass is on the line with this company, yeah. well, he's he's sticking up for me, right? And like mm -hmm. he's, he's saying this is okay. Well, yeah. at that point in time I realized even though I'm making mistakes or that I'm screwing stuff up, I have to be moderately good here because Rick wouldn't be doing what he's doing without that. Right. Like, right. I mean, so, true. so, so to me that like, I learned that and how valuable that was because that left such a, you know, an impression on me. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and then, and then you talk to him. I mean, I remember sitting in a crown room with him some years later. I'm not sure. It was probably a year, a couple of years later. And, I, I was an owner at that point in time and had, had the opportunity to buy in. And, and and so we're talking about a handful of things. We're sitting in a crown room. I don't remember what city it was, but I remember sitting on the glass in this crown room. It was a beautiful sunny day. And we were talking about, however we got to it, we were talking about this instance. And he's he's like, uh, I was like, man, Rick, I was like, it is funny. You know, I still remember these times and the things that I've screwed up and how bad that was. And, and I remember you specifically telling me it's okay. And I remember you telling me, don't worry, it's going to be all right. And I remember sitting in my apartment, you know, in, in Richmond, because I was on site, in the dark, no furniture, just <laughs> against the wall. There's one light on in the, in the dining room that's supposed to have a table. And I'm just sitting there oh, thinking, boy. God, I'm talking to you on this phone and you're telling me it's going to be okay. I'll take care of it. And he's like, yeah. He's like, uh, he's like, I had to tell Jeff and Dick that if they wanted to fire you, they were going to have to fire me too. You never really know. You don't know how good of a leader you really are until, you know, you, you kind of get perspective. And yeah. Yeah, so, so, so it's you hard. think you're doing that today? I think I am helping to perpetuate a culture that has been built and established and I'm just trying to help protect it. Uh, yeah. And I think, I think we do a really good job of it. I know that we give people a ton of rope way more than probably most anybody else in, in this industry. Yeah. And it's hard for people. I mean, I'd love to sit here and tell you everybody we hire makes it and everybody yeah. loves the life yeah. that they, they pick yeah. with us. But it's not, you know, that's not the truth. The reality is, yeah. I mean, I've had multiple conversations where people come to me and they go, you know, I love everything about this place and you in the interview, everything you told me about the responsibility and being the one in charge and having all every aspect of the construction process being yours to own was exactly why I came here. But it's also the reason that I have to leave because I just can't, yeah. I can't do it. It's too much yeah. for me. It's yeah. a lot. It can be a lot. It can be a ton. And it can be a lot. We ask a lot of our people and, and we know that we try to create that environment that allows them things that they don't get in other places, you know, the sabbatical programs and the, yeah. the we're talking with Josh and Brian about your sabbatical program mm -hmm. and yeah. they were telling us about it. And I was just like, I love that idea. You can be friends with people at work and have a good time with yeah. the people yeah. that you work yeah. with. It doesn't have to just be a destination that you go to, you punch a time clock and you leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw your ping pong table and when I came in the door here and, and, you know, made me kind of chuckle because we've got that and you get the golden oh, yeah. tea and, <laughs> no, the one golden thing team. we're missing. <laughs> yeah, I saw the golden tea, my guy. I saw the go. We went to your office in the Northeast. We and, did. And uh, you had a badass game room, the golden tea, the ping pong. Dude. Didn't you lose that day? I got my butt kicked in ping pong that day <laughs> by one of your regional 
vice president to that or whatever. He's like, no one beats me. And, I'm and like, he was right. I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> no, yeah. That, I did not we had that. such a great time. Yeah, I did not. But that culture is huge. I believe in that culture. I love having the open concept vibe and bar and ring the bell if you sell a job and do a shot, freaking play games. I think it builds company morale. It does. It character. makes it fun. And energy, too. Work man. doesn't always have to be serious. It makes it fun. Tough industry, man. And oh, like, very. The, it's, it's a hard industry. There are so many things that none of us control in, of in the situations of what they are. Mm-hmm. You know, we really just ask that people, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Exactly. If you're going to commit to doing it, mm-hmm. do it. And we're going to try and do the same thing. And we're not perfect. Like, yeah. you know, it's, we yeah. screw up schedules. We ask people to show up when they shouldn't have been there. We, yeah. We have our problems as well, and it's just not perfect. But you got to recognize, you know, where your imperfections are. I think that one of the things that I think matters with us in terms of our relationships with our vendors is, is we, we do recognize that sometimes we're the problem, and we want to know when we're the problem. Like, I want to hear from from the subs if, if, hey, look, you know, our DBM's not doing the job, and he's putting you in a bad spot, or... or a, you know, super's doing a terrible job. You know, I want to hear when they're doing great jobs too. But if they're not helping, like you're in this business to make money, we're in this business to make money. We will all make money together yes. if we do a good job of working together. That's yeah. that's our belief, and yeah. you know, it's cool. it's hard. Yeah, that's actually that couldn't be truer words than never been spoken here, Jake. Because the jobs that we had to, you know, the pleasure of working with you on. I mean, you guys are, you know. I can say this on air. I'm, I'm, I'm okay saying it. You guys are one of the most fair general contractors we've ever worked yes. with. And you guys come in with a partnership mentality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're not always right. And, and you're not always right. But but we find a way to come together and, and make it our problem together. Collectively, mm-hmm. it's how can we how can we both win? There will be days that it won't feel that way. Oh, but, there's uh, days where it's like, oh, gosh, yeah. here we go. That's just part <laughs> you of You wake up and you're like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> I think the difference is when you have people that are passionate about what you're doing, you, there's your words, not mine, then that these people will, they own the responsibility. They, they feel it, right? Like yeah. there's a personal pride in yeah. what they're doing. And, yeah. and so that's just part of the whole thing. I think that's part of why our clients like us. I think that's part of what makes us successful as a business is that idea of central ownership and the fact that, you know, we are as individuals in these organizations contributing directly to these projects not just, well, I did an estimate for it, or I did some purchasing for it, or I did what have you. Like, we're, we're all in that every step of the way, and, and it matters. You guys have to take credit for your success and growth. It's true. I mean, you guys earned it. You guys worked your ass off for it, put everything on the line for it. Very curious. How, how did you get into the industrial cold storage construction industry? Arco was, again, a very small organization at the time, right? And we had Maricold right there in our backyards, right? The biggest player of cold storage at the time and, yeah. and, and still right there at the top today. Yeah. And so Rick had a relationship with Fred Walker. Uh, and uh, so we were chasing cold work for Fred on a regular basis. Rick had identified- Fred Walker was a miracle, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so uh, Rick, Rick had identified fairly early coming to Atlanta that Cold storage was an opportunity niche sort of business that allowed for us to kind of separate ourselves from just yeah. any other contractor. Yeah. And and Rick, Rick is a super detail-oriented guy. Like he used to drive me and a lot of people nuts with like he'd sit down and go, okay, I just need to have a simple, I just need your input on what the cost for this is per linear foot on this, you know, roof header. And and he'd sit down and you'd be there for 45 minutes at the end of it. You knew exactly how many nails you needed in the, <laughs> the nailer all the way around and across the top and the size and all, yeah. you know, so it was like, there was that kind of detail, which you need for cold storage, right? Like yeah. you have to have, these buildings will tell you when you've screwed them up very quickly. <laughs> yes, they will. <laughs> and if you don't pay attention to that kind of level of detail, you got problems. And so like that was, I saw that with Rick, he had that. And so he, appreciated that about the cold storage business and knew that that was part of what he could sell. Mm -hmm. And so he got into that concept pretty early. One of the first projects that he ever did in Atlanta in 94, 95 was, was a a Vistar project, right? And now owned by PFG, but was starting to do some of that. And, uh, 
And so then he got in with Miracle a little bit, and we did a little bit of work with Miracle. By the time I got there, we were looking at these cold jobs on a fairly regular basis. It was not all we were doing. We were yeah. still very heavily also mm-hmm. vested in the the just regular dry industrial business. And we really, for the most part, just own the concept of design build. Mm-hmm. And if it's in the industrial market, then we're okay. We like doing that. We've branched out of that a little bit as time has gone on, but that's... Those two things are the bread and butter of this business. It's got to be design build, and we really like that industrial market. And so cold is just a piece of that where it's way more complex and not everybody can do it. So for me, when I got there in 99, it was like, okay, the first day I showed up to work, you know, I'd moved from Atlanta. He hands me a plane ticket, and he's like, hey, we need you to fly to, to New Jersey. I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, how long? And he's like, I don't know, three, four months. And I'm like... But I, I just got here now. Like, I don't even I don't even know the accounting lady. Like, I don't. It, well, New Jersey. Okay. okay. Well, what do you need? And he's like, well, one of the DBMs, uh, their wife has cancer, and and he needs to spend a little bit more time here, and so we need your help to help support him up there. But being on site because he can't travel as much. And I'm yeah. like, wow. Okay, I get it. Let me go home. I haven't really unpacked all my boxes, so I guess I'll just leave that. I'll just grab a whole bunch of clothes and off we go. And Mm -hmm. So what was supposed to be three months was four months, and that was on a cold storage job for uh, a client called Ameriserve, who's no longer in business. Um, But uh, it was a cold deal, and that, I was like, from that day forward, was, was into the cold world. I've done plenty of stuff since and a variety of different manufacturing and dry and all that sort of stuff. But cold kind of got into my blood from, mm-hmm. from day one with Arco and uh, hasn't really left. So it's, it's been great. Good. Great yeah. business. Well, speaking of cold being in your blood, could you share with us and our listeners maybe one of the coolest projects you've done, a cool story you've had, in your experience in the cold industry. And of course, this will be sponsored, our cool moment, by our friends at Jamison Doors. Jamison. (laughs) Cool moment time. I like it. Let's go. I think something that helped define my mentality or or just helped really cement my understanding of how we do business. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a project for a client called United Natural Foods. This goes back quite a few years. And... um, they had the, their the UNFI was not who UNFI is today. They were very, you know, they were relatively small and starting on their early growth uh, yeah. stages. And we had met them fairly early in Atlanta because one of their first facilities they did was in Atlanta and we got partnered up with them. And so it worked yeah. great because they just happened to go into a developer building that we were doing. And so we started to build this relationship with UNFI, of which I hadn't really been a part of building it. You know, I had I was doing other things at that point in time, but the guy that had developed this this you know, relationship with UNFI for us moved up to Philly to start the Philadelphia office. And when he did that, he didn't take that client with because that client was really an Atlanta-based client with with Rick Schultz and, and Mark Mummer, who was kind of the the lead on that account, but Mark had been started to climb the ranks within Arco as well and was no longer really a, a project manager. He was more of kind of a, an operational leader at that point. And so when Jason went up to Philly, somebody had to help start running some of these cold jobs for UNFI, of which I had some experience doing cold, so I was a good fit for him. Mm-hmm. And so I'm in California and I'm walking this facility in, in, uh, in Rockland, California with uh, the head of, of UNFI president of the organization. And this is, I don't know, 05, somewhere in that range, maybe 06, something like that. And as we're walking through it, I had sold this job. I had done all the estimating. I had done the specs. I had done everything about it and, and had worked through all this with Mike. And we're now pretty well complete. All the panels are up in the box in the box freezers. The sprinklers are all in. The doors are going up. And we're within, I don't know, a month of turning the building over. And we're walking through and Mike looks up the ceiling and he goes, these are those sprinklers that we can hit with a forklift, right? And water won't come out of them. And I went, yeah, double interlock sprinklers. No, these aren't those. Like, you know, we had talked about all this earlier and it's a single interlock sprinkler system, which is basically just, you know, hit the head and it's dry in the box, but you hit the head and water's coming out. Mm -hmm. And he went, well, that's a problem, Jake. And I went, Ooh, okay. 
okay. And I started to get into the defensive mode of, wait a minute, hold on. I, you and I talked about this way early on. I wrote a spec. It's written out very clear as day. That this is what we're doing. Like all these things are going through my head. Yeah. I know what I estimated. I know, I know how we got here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm looking at him and he goes, he goes, Jake, he's like, why do we do business with you guys? And I said, why? Mike, I, you know, I think you do business because you like us and we do a good job for this and that. He's like, no, Jake, we do business because you know what we need. I don't know what a single interlock sprinkler is or a double interlock sprinkler is, but you know that we hit heads. And when we hit heads, we don't want water and ice. That's what you guys know. You know that. You, oh, wow. we do business because you know that and you take care of us. Mm -hmm. And I went, you're right, Mike. That is exactly what we are striving to do as an organization. That is exactly what our clients should be thinking when, when yeah. they have this. And I will fix this. And it costs us, I don't know, $100,000, $125,000 to swap that system out mm -hmm. in a very short period of time to make it all work and things like that. And that, wow. that's a lot of money today. It was a hell of a lot of money then. Yeah. But you know, I went back and I talked to, to Rick and Mark and I'm like, dude, this is, this is, this is what I screwed up. You know, one of those times, you know, I'm going to get fired. This is what I screwed up. And this is, this is, this is what he told me. And he's, and he's like, well, yeah, he's exactly right. You need, we need to do that. Like, yeah. this is going to be a painful pill to swallow, but this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And so like, to me, that, that was a very, it was a cool moment in my growing as a, yes. as into the business, right? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm on the brink of becoming an owner in the business. I have to <laughs> understand really what our core purpose is as an enterprise. And understand what your clients want. Understand yeah. what the clients want and understand that, hey, look, when you're wrong, you're wrong. It doesn't matter how much it costs. When you're wrong, you're wrong. And you have to just do it and fix it and take care of it. I wasn't even really, I wasn't wrong by the letter of the law. I was just wrong by what we should be selling for our clients, right? Yeah. And so to me, that was, that's, that's a big moment in understanding, you know, business and understanding who Arco is. And I'd been with us for you know, quite a few years at that point in time, but you're still always learning. But speaking of that, Jake, you know, this is one of my favorite questions to ask anybody that comes on cool times podcast with us. And, and, you know, this is your opportunity to, you know, gloat, if you will, <laughs> um, <laughs> But no, I mean, why, why should people buy from Arco Design Builder? Why should people buy from Jake Steffen? It's funny. I think there's, there's a couple things that, that I would tell people this is why you buy from us. And, and without joking about the value, I do think part of the reason people buy from us is they genuinely, genuinely like us. Yeah. We value relationships. You know, we spend a lot of time building relationships. That's a huge part of what we do. We don't have to do this business. We are diversified in a bunch of different other things across the industrial markets that like cold is, you know, just something that we, we very much like doing mm -hmm. mainly because we really like the people. I mean, yeah. you know, that that's the reality of it. So because we really like some of these people, I think some of these people really like us yeah. and in business. <laughs> it's, true. it's just like you do business with yeah. the people that you like and, yeah. and instances where you can. And, and so I think that's part of it. Now, why do they like us? I think there's a multitude of different reasons, but I think the fact that we invest in those relationships from a long-term standpoint, we, you know, from a business development standpoint, part of our methodology is don't talk to somebody when they have a project opportunity. Talk to them way before they have a project opportunity because there's no pressure to get to know them. They don't feel like, you know, that, that you're just there because you're chasing this project, right? And so, you know, we have relationships that extend years before they ever have anything, you know, and may never pan out to be anything. You know, it's just planting seeds. That's all you're doing. Exactly. So, so I think that's a piece of it. But there is very much a technical component to it. I think we view ourselves as a consultant more than we view ourselves as a contractor. Right? Okay. And so we just happen to do all this other stuff that, that extends from it. But we really think of ourselves as, as more of an expert in design and an expert in these businesses. We want to understand the client's businesses realistically, if we could, more than they do. And in some instances, we do, right? Yeah, sure. In some instances, you know, we've got people that come to us that they don't understand. You know, yeah. well, what? Why would you use? Why would you use an air door instead of a high speed door? We've always just used a high speed door. Well, you want to use an air door here because you were in and out of that door so many times. It doesn't fucking matter that's there. This is what we're supposed to be. Is we're supposed to know all these different ins and outs. We're supposed to be able to help advise them on different refrigeration systems and which ones work and which ones don't. And 
what kind of floor system works and what the best racking system is for the type of products that they have and how yeah. they operate their business. So we try to do that and be that on the upfront. And it's a lot easier to do that and build that when they don't necessarily have an opportunity, right? And so we're able to kind of show that and help take them through all of that. The other benefit I think that we have is we coming from the dry industrial world and doing a lot of those types of projects, we work a lot with developers. Mm -hmm. And so prior to the last few years, there weren't a lot of developers that paid any attention to this cold storage world. That's true. Yep. <laughs> and, and frankly, the, unless you were Americold or Lineage or one of these big monster you know, cold storage companies, you never had to worry about what it was like to develop a property. You had to do it because there was nobody that would do it for you, but you didn't know anything about that per sure. se. And so there was a lot of risk for, for these, these companies that were doing this and owning these facilities, buying the property and, and having to know all the ins and the outs about what they were buying. What, was the dirt they were buying good dirt, bad dirt? What the, the, the geotechs look like? And, and all these different parameters that we, coming from the industrial side on the dry side, dealt with developers all the time. We know all these questions to ask. We understand how to look at zoning. We understand how to look at setbacks. We understand how to analyze the sites and the environmentals and all of that on the upfront. So we do a lot of that just as a gratis sort of part of our service of, of these building relationships. So this is a big part of that consultancy part that I'm talking about when, when I think this is what we really do. We carry all that because it's what our developer clients are doing and we see it all the time. So we're very used to it and we know all these questions to ask and that's part of what we go through. And so I think that coupled with the, the expertise aspect of what we do and just understanding and owning these, these designs around the businesses that are being built is, is a big part of, of why people go, yeah, okay, we like them and they know a hell of a lot of shit. So I guess we're okay experts, right? For sure. Like I say, it's not because we won't screw up We'll screw something up. I don't know that we ever get through a project where we don't make a mistake. We were yeah. talking about you know, one over here where we've already got we got something wrong. But yeah. again, it goes back to that lesson earlier of it's not what you screw up, it's how you react to what you screw up. And fix it, man. How you fix it and deal solutions, with it. Solutions, baby. Solutions, not problems. Yep. And that's yep. it. Love that. Love that. Very yeah. cool. What's your favorite trade show? Oh, man. You know, <laughs> we ask this question all the time. What your favorite trade show is, man? And we, we love this question. Don't feel any pressure either, either to answer the one we like the most. All right. <laughs> no pressure here, Jake. Come on. We love them all. He does a great job with, with a lot of them. As an organization, there are trade shows and, and the interaction between the, the, whether it be the end users, whether it be the GCs, whether it be the vendors, like I, I think is phenomenal. Uh, I am, of course, biased towards SIBA. Uh, I think that is, you know, one of the, it's not one of the, I think it is the best association we've ever been a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the most real, it is the most down to earth, it is the most, you know, the, the people there are, are tremendous in terms of the value that they add to the projects. Yeah, I mean, like, if you're not in the cold storage business, you don't understand really how detailed and how difficult this business is. And, so the people that, that work in it, man, we, we got to be special. And, and that's a room full of very special people all across the board. Uh, and, and so I, I love that. I will still attend that, that show. I'll probably still come to GCCA stuff in general because it's just, it's been such a big part of, of my growth and development and, and a part of who I am in this business. Yep. Uh, so, so I really like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just not a big fan of trade shows in general, so it's it's not really <laughs> hard to separate on some of these. Yeah, so so one of the cool things about these trade shows, like like a SIBA, Jake, is you know we all, we all become friends, right? I mean, even our competitors, we all become friends, and and you know one example of that is kind of a I guess a cool moment for us is that you know we are still semi new as a company, and and I had met with you at in Colorado at uh, that one conference. Might have been a joint board meeting with IRW at the time. You had a really big project coming up, and 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 I we had talked about it, and and you told me that you know, hey, listen, I asked I asked one of your competitors about you if you could do this job, if if you're capable of doing this size job, yeah. Um, 
And and he told you straight up, he's like, yeah, dude, Vince has got you and they can do it. And, and you ended up giving us that job and the job worked out fantastic. And, mm-hmm. and shout out to my guy, dude, Charles Woolley. I mean, dude, he, he put his, he put his freaking rep on the line with you saying that we could do something for you, you know, blessed enough, lucky enough, call it hard work, whatever we, we delivered uh, on a huge project. And it it goes back to doing what you say you're going to do. Totally. We, we said we were going to do it. mm -hmm. We took all the steps to make sure that we performed for you, make sure that we, you know, lived up to what Charles said Mm -hmm. to what your expectations were. Mm -hmm. Like that's what, that's what you do. And, and then that's I, why it's good to have friendly competitors. It's good to have friendly competitors. And we hooked them up with a nice bottle of Louis XIII afterwards. <laughs> so shout out to you, Charles. Hope you like your cognac. <laughs> you know, I, I had talked to Charles, yes. I, you, know, you had spent a lot of time talking with Josh about oh, yeah. it as yeah. well. Yeah. And, you know, Josh and I had sat down and talked a bunch about this and in terms of how it was. And, you know, Josh is a detailed guy, mm-hmm. just like I'm a detailed guy. And so my conversations with Josh were very much like, how's he going to do it? What's he going to do? And you knew exactly how many people you had. We were going to have. We were like, I think it was like, we're going to have 24 people. We're going to be able to do this. We're going to be able to get this done. We can get it done over this time. Like, it was not a, like, you had to start and take forever project. It was a very specific timeline that we had to have. Dude, that was like a 12 to 14 month job that we had to get done in like eight like months. You would put in the work on the upfront to illustrate that. You had a plan. It wasn't just like, well, I can figure this out later. It was you who put that work in at the upfront, right? Of course. And to us, that sort of stuff means a lot because that's how we win projects with clients. We put the work in to design these buildings and figure all this stuff out of our own time and energy, right? And so it's investment. And when we see investment and we know that people have a plan, it means a lot. So when Josh and I were talking through all that, there there was that whole piece of, okay, there's a comfort in knowing that. This isn't just, yeah, we're, we're rolling the dice and we'll figure it out when we get there. It was There's a plan and we know exactly how to do it. And we knew it was a big deal for you guys because of where you were as a company. But that also was somewhat reassuring because we knew you as people, right? Yeah, like, so sure. we knew if they are going to commit to this and this is their baby, mm-hmm. like they are not going to let this fail. And yeah. so... So again, it's as much a testament to you guys and who you are as as it is to to us and you know being willing to go with with the upstart young little baby company to go ahead and do this monster project. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Wait, just one second, Jake. Tell our listeners before we get to Vince's favorite portion. Okay. How can they find you? How can they find out more about Arco, about what Arco's doing, or even about you, what you're doing? Where do they go? What socials are you on? Where can people find you? The website is obviously first and foremost where I tell people to go www.arcodb.com. That will link you to all kinds of different stuff, right? It, yep. it, that covers all the offices and all the places that we're at and based. Yeah. Uh, and so so that that would be first and foremost. Look at that. Okay. Um, then you, you can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on LinkedIn. You can follow us. I think we're even on Instagram. I'm not really sure. <laughs> you got to be on all the socials. Are you TikToking? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not on TikTok, Jake? You got to be on TikTok, man. It's one of those things. I find it funny. Like I, I Even like these podcasts and stuff that I've done, it's like, who wants to hear any of my inner thoughts? Like, why? <laughs> I have. Yeah. Dude, why would I offer any of this out there? Half of it's because it's an inner thought, and I want it to remain an inner <laughs> thought and not be broadcast to the world. Well, I mean, Jake, you should broadcast to the world. I mean, I took, you know, I took a million notes here, and you know, I I learned something new on every podcast we have with yeah. different people because I love hearing people's experiences where they came from and i want to learn from people and i absorb things from people i mean i'm writing all this stuff down you own the moment all the rick schultz stuff about hey man this is on me i own that right Mm -hmm. i i let you fail because i should have been there more for you right talk to a client before they have a project all these things like you know i think a good leader and just anyone that wants to grow personally should absorb everything they can from people and not just, you know, shut it down. They, even some of the inner thoughts. <laughs> even your inner thoughts, Jake. Even your inner thoughts. All right, Jake. We are entering the end of our show, and we want to be cognizant of your time here. So we are entering the rapid round question. It was sponsored by our good friends at Jamison Door Company. 
uh, serving the industry for over 100 years. Our good friends, Jamison, make one hell of a door. Great Don't product. they, Jenna? Great product. Awesome. So, Jake, I'm going to ask you this for that question, and you have to pick one. And sure, right That's out of the that. <laughs> right out of the gate, California or Texas? Go ahead. Oh, it's Texas. Okay. Of course, you pick Texas. You should pick Texas. All right, first one: um, lose your hair or your sense of smell. Hair. One hundred days in Antarctica or a hundred days on the moon. Wow. Uh, probably the moon. You want to show that they'd be different. You want to be meme famous. Or commercial famous? I want to be famous. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, probably meme famous then, because that's, that's that's like Washington. You know, it goes away. You're just a yeah. picture. Nobody really knows who you are. All right. So no internet or no running water? Man. You know, I think I could live without the internet. I think I'd go no internet. Yeah. Break up via text or email? Any sort of written document, I would probably do it via email because I would think that that would be the easier way to be avoided, avoiding the situation. Like text, yeah. text the damn thing dings in and then you get yeah. an immediate response. I don't want any of that. Yeah. yeah. Magical strength or invisibility cape? Probably the invisibility cape. Sometimes you just want to disappear. Yeah, totally. Uh, freon refrigeration or ammonia refrigeration? I, I like the ammonia. There's something about that industrial. I'm an industrial guy. That's yeah, my are. kind of thing. Yeah, you are. Cold beer or cold drink? Boy. Uh, I'm a whiskey guy, so I'd probably go cold drink. Mm-hmm. All right, last but not least, my boys, Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber? JT. JT. I can't stand Bieber. Thank you so much, Jake, for coming on the show yeah. with us. And in studio. In Thank studio. You. Um, dude, you are awesome. This one was badass, man. Super fun. And... Uh, Everyone that's listening, thank you guys so much. You guys can find our work on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The socials. LinkedIn. We provide little 30-second clips on YouTube. You guys can actually subscribe to our show, watch the actual video of the podcast. Mm -hmm. If you can listen to it in your car uh, anytime you want, Uh, old shows, new shows on the Apple Podcast app. And uh, yeah, just, just hit that subscribe button on that too. Help grow the audience. Share this. Uh, share this interview if you liked it with your friends and family and coworkers. And you know, until next time, guys. Thank you, guys, so much. And Jake, thank you. Yeah.